I want to give him a little bit of an introduction. He was born in Tallahassee, Florida, has been preaching the gospel since 1985. He currently serves as a senior minister at the Southside Church of Christ in Orlando, Florida, and has been there since December 1999. Previously, he served at the Spring Hill Road Church of Christ in Tallahassee, Florida as well. He has been married to the former Pamela Hadley since August 30th, 1980. They've been blessed with two children, Jonathan Wesley and Brianna Leanne, and beautiful grandchildren, Kaylin Wesley Skinner. And uh, also it says here that he is passionate about golf. I also heard coming in, and this is very unfortunate, he's a Gator fan. <laughs> yeah, from Tallahassee of all places, and, and he's a Gator fan. I'll, I'll let you Seminole fans take care of the rest tonight. But anyway, we are so thrilled and very fortunate to have him here with us tonight. So I'm going to turn things over to Brother Wesley. Brother Wesley, God bless. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm visiting. You should make me feel more welcome than that. Good. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. It is really my distinct honor, privilege, and pleasure to be here at the Central Church for the very first time. I've, I've uh, been cozy and copacetic with Brother Slate Moore. He's a part of our, our um, equipped conference. And of course, Brother Jack McDonald. I've been knowing him for a number of years. And uh, I'm your brother from Orlando, Florida, Southside Church of Christ. Uh, just your brother from another mother. That's, uh, uh, and the only difference between me and most of you is that uh, I just stayed in the oven a little longer than you did. But uh, uh, I am born and raised and educated in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, but I am a diehard Gator fan. And for you Seminoles and Crimson Tide, it, it's not a problem because everybody has a sin. Okay, <laughs> you, you're the people that Jesus died for. Uh, 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 but no, we, we have a good time. Jack, Jack McDonald and I just, I'm a hard Gator fan, just a number of years. I grew up in Tallahassee, and uh, the Seminoles were not very good when I was born in 1960s and 70s, and I uh, uh, fell in love with the Gators then, and I've been a Gator ever since. Uh, I'm from Florida A&M University, so I'm a Rattler and a Gator and a Seminole hater. That's what we call it. Uh, uh, now, you, you, you Crimson Tide people, I, I have no understanding how you can be uh, for Alabama. You're in Central Florida. And you, uh, <laughs> well, that you do. That you do well. uh, that's, it's a religion. And out of uh, it's it really is. I, I'm just really honored to be here tonight to share my conviction, my faith in Jesus to Christ as a proud member of His body, His kingdom, the church. Uh, what we preachers do is brag on Jesus. That, that's that's what we do. We brag on Jesus. Lord, deliver me from the preacher that brags on himself. Our job is to brag on Jesus. My mentor taught me. He said, "Son, it's." There's two things you need to do when you stand before people. First of all, preach from the Bible. And second of all, don't take too long before you get to Jesus. And uh, if you do those two things, you'll be all right. And so uh, I'm sure you're familiar tonight because Brother uh, Slate Moore is uh, well known in our circle. We, and our, I've been fortunate in the last 12 years to serve on the board of the uh, Equip Conference formerly known as Spiritual Growth Conference, and when we're selecting speakers for our uh, biannual conference, uh, his name is always prevalent and at the frontness of our minds. It's good to be here with you guys, and uh, may God bless you. I have been given a subject tonight uh, dealing with a very familiar passage in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua, the 24th chapter. Uh, Joshua is the sixth book in your Bible. Uh, 
it, uh, of course, uh, is essential uh, in Hebrew history that you understand the book of Joshua. And of course, the Old Testament's sole purpose is pointing us toward Jesus the Christ. God went through exhaustive means and measures to get us to Jesus. He spared no detail. He, he could have just opened the Bible with Jesus. You're rotten people, we're all sinners, but he didn't do that. He, he uh, developed, uh, scooped up some dust from the ground many years ago, and with the dust of the ground, he made a man. And that man was a mannequin until God breathed Numod into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul, Sumod. God breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. And that man was void and destitute. Even though he was the zenith, the apex, the crown jewel of all of God's creation, that man was void and destitute of a relationship with God. And that man's name was Adam, you remember? And he had a wife named Eve, and they sinned in the Garden of Eden. They lived in a utopia, a panacea. Uh, God had set them up, and they sinned, and sin separates us from God. Now, I'm sorry, Senator, I forgot to tell y'all. Where I preach, folks say amen. Uh, so when you see me pause, that means the amen belongs there. That's, okay, so I'm not pausing because I'm out of breath. I'm, I'm called because I'm waiting on the amen, uh, the, the validation. Is that all right? I, I mean, that may not be normal, but can y'all indulge me just for tonight, please? I, I, I did endure all of I-4. There was a terrible accident. There was a horrific storm. My wife and grandchild are waiting on me at home. I hadn't had dinner yet. And so can y'all at least indulge me for a few minutes? Uh, and so you know the story of the Bible. And that sin, sin separates us from God. And then God went on this exhaustive story in the Old Testament to get us to our Redeemer, to Jesus. And then Abraham, hey man, there you go, there you go. Even the Christian time people got it. Hey <laughs> And, 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 he, and so uh, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. From Jacob comes the 12 tribes of Israel. He had 12 sons by four different women. The fourth son name was Judah. 42 generations later comes Jesus to Christ who built the church of Christ. Ain't that good news? Yeah. Amen belongs there. And, and so a part of this lengthy Hebrew history you know the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah, the law, the Pentateuch, the Mishnu. Uh, Moses penned them himself. But by the time we get to the sixth book of the Bible, Joshua, Yahshua in the Hebrew, he, he, he is now the successor to Moses. Uh, Joshua comes with impeccable credentials. He's not only the successor to Moses, he was a valiant captain of the Hebrew army. He was Moses' right-hand man. He was there with Moses at Mount Sinai. He was there with Moses in the valley of Kadesh. He was there with Moses in the plains of Paran. But when Moses died, you might recall, then God buried his remains in a secret grave at Mount Nebo. God called and summoned Joshua to succeed Moses and gave him a promotion. He's no longer Captain Joshua. He's General Joshua. It was Moses who parted the Red Sea. Amen. It was Moses who God gave a rod and he stretched it out. And God, in a beautiful miracle in the Old Testament, separated the H2 from the O. Amen belongs there. <laughs> and the children of Israel marched across on dry ground. But it was Moses who led them through the Red Sea. But it was Joshua who led them to forge the Jordan River. And now he succeeded Moses. Joshua chapter 1. Read it in the personal privacy of your own praying ground. God said and declared emphatically, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And whatever your feet shall trod upon, from this place down to the great river Euphrates, God declared, I'll be with you. It is that Joshua who comes tonight 
and leaves a record. And I love these. He has one of the distinctions that only a few biblical writers had. One of the distinctions he has is the book he wrote bears his name. Joshua. Yahshua. He, he declares in Hebrews and, and Joshua 24. That's the hallway we'll walk for a few phonetic moments tonight. Verse number 15, for those who are familiar, Joshua 24, 15. Here's what he says. And this was, uh, you know, I'm going to do a quick expository of the text. And I'll probably do an exegete, uh, exegete of the text. And then we'll call it history. Joshua 24, 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your fathers, who your fathers serve on the other side of the flood, are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen, Amen. Amen belongs there. L listen, Joshua says, listen, folks. Uh, you can take door number one. That's the god of the Amorites. Uh, of the God of your fathers on the other side. That's before. That's the Egyptians. I, that's before the flood. Of uh, uh, the God of the Amorites in whose land we live in. But as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Jo and now notice the verbiage. Notice the lexicon. Notice the language. Joshua said, when I speak, I speak for Sister Joshua, Joshua Jr., and Joshua Nequa. I speak for the whole house. A real man, a godly man, a spiritual man, a Christian man ought to be able to speak for the whole house. Yeah. Uh, have y'all gotten caught up in the modern political correctness? Have y'all gotten caught up in the 21st century jargon? Have y'all gotten caught up in the movement that has moved man out of his rightful place that God put. Uh, uh, are there any men left who are still the head of the house? Uh, okay. I was going to bless the men here tonight, but I can see y'all are scared. As, uh, you, you do know the man is the head of the house. Y'all have a problem with that? Okay, well, maybe I need to go another way tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, God called us the husband. You know where that word comes from? It's a compound word, husband. First part of that word hus comes from the word house. It's the house. Second part of that word band, as in an apparatus to keep you together, like a rubber band. God declared that the man is the band that goes around the house. That's why you're the husband. Amen belongs to that. Uh, uh, now, some of y'all will go home tonight and say, I'm the band around that. If you hadn't laid any groundwork for that, you might better stay right where you are. Uh, uh, but, 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 but you are the husband. Okay, and I don't care what society says. I don't care how political. I, and believe me, I, I'm not here to bash women or bash men. I'm here to preach the Bible. Amen belongs there. Uh, listen, uh, don't get me wrong. I've been married 38 years. I know to keep my wife happy, I got to uh, yeah. uh, tread softly. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm bored and destitute of good sense. But I am preaching the Bible. I'm for right even if I'm not doing it. Amen belongs there. Uh, uh, see, see you, you, Slate, you and I, can I just talk to you? Because I, I can see it's going to be, I, I, I can see it's going to be, the rest of your brothers are looking at me very like, walk easy. Okay. Uh, if, if, you, if you see what God set up initially, there's two institutions that God ordained and sanctioned in the Bible, the home and the church. And God, in his infinite wisdom, put the man, the husband, in charge of both. Uh, do do y'all have female preachers here? No. You have female worship leaders here? Okay. So the men lead? They do. Why? Because that's what God said. 
Don't ever be afraid to be for what God's for. That, that's the problem. That's the problem we have in our world now. Christians are silent. We allow things to happen in our political discourse, in our society, in our world, in our environment that are barren to the word of God. And we say nothing because we've been intimidated to be quiet. But as long as I'm a law-abiding, tax-paying, church-going citizen of these United States, I have a voice as well. Uh, uh, God said, you're the husband. You are the band around the house. It doesn't diminish you, sister. Uh, you are the woman. The female, you know what that word means? Woman, woman, woe, W-O, comes from the word womb. God says you are the man who has the womb. That's why you call a woman. Okay, okay. Beautiful young lady just walked in. Don't know her name, but she's sitting by the preacher and his wife, so I'm assuming she's good people. You know why the Bible calls you a female? You know where that word comes from? You're the male, you know what F E means in female? Fetus. You're the male who carries the fetus. That's why you're the female. You're the man, woman, who has the womb. You're not less than us, you're different than us. We have different roles. Amen, amen. Aren't men and women different? If you don't know that by now, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay. <laughs> Joshua speaks with the authority given him by God. Not only is he a, a, a leader of the Hebrew people and the movement to get us to Jesus, he's been sanctioned by God. He speaks emphatically. Notice what he says. Did y'all read with me? As for me and my house, I, I, I dare to tell you, if more men could speak for the house, uh, how can I say this and not get in trouble? When there's a proliferation of men in the family, the home has disintegrated and right on the heels of that is the church. Because when men are absent, when men are not taking their right for God in place, not as dictators, not, you don't, you're not better than your wife. You got a different road in your wife. And it's a, it's a hard job being a man. You know, you're the leader. You get blamed for stuff you didn't do. You're the leader. It may, it may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. You're the leader. I'm looking for a man here and I can't get one. <laughs> Uh, next time I come here, if I'm ever invited back, I'll bring a sign up and just say, amen. Do you, <laughs> you know when to say amen? L listen, Joshua speaks with the authority of God. This was before there was an America. This is before we had democracy. This is before we had uh, constitutional rights. This is before ERA, the, the, the woman's movement. This is before the Me Too movement. This is when men were in charge of the house. And I'm not advocating women being indentured servants and property. That, that's wrong. That's, that's not what God's getting. What God is saying, I do have order in every institution God ordained in sex. He has order. Uh, you know, heaven has a God, Jesus, man, woman, children. And what's happened in America, we got it all mixed up. Children ahead of the parents. <laughs> you know, it's just a messed up world. But if we ever got back in order with God, we'd be all right. Amen belongs there. Uh, he says, when I speak, I speak for Sister Joshua. Joshua Jr. And daughter Joshua. As for me and my house, I want you to notice something. You missed this. He did not say we will worship the Lord. He said we will serve the Lord. Too many Christians today, if I would be so bold, they worship on Sunday, but no service the rest of the week. Some of us think if we just get our bread and juice, and you got to get your bread and juice. You got to get your bread and juice. Amen. 
And once you get your bread and juice, be careful, Central, that you don't go home and have gin and juice. <laughs> but he didn't say we worship. He said we serve the Lord. Y'all do know we come here to learn. <laughs> Who did this? Wow. Oh, oh, okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> This is very nice. Thank you. Can you travel with me when I go to... Uh, listen, folks. We enter here to learn. We exit to serve. You don't serve God. We worship God here. We serve God over Polk County. We serve God in Winter Haven. We serve God in Orlando. If all you do is worship God, you're not much used to God. May I be so bold? Sure. Joshua, I didn't write the Bible, I just preached it. He, he didn't say we wish. That's for me in my house, he said we will serve the Lord. We need more Christians who have a spirit of servitude. Amen. Have you ever noticed Sunday morning, what time y'all start on Sunday? It's late. 9.30 same thing we do. And what time is worship? 10.30. 10, Y'all have the same schedule. At 10.30 on Sunday, we have 350 people at our congregation. But if we have a ministry to feed somebody or help somebody or teach somebody, distinct minority. I got a lot of people who are willing to worship. I only have a few people who are willing to serve. If we can get the Lord's church, the church of Christ, but people had a servitude attitude. I think we'd be better off. Amen belongs there. Amen. Thank you, man. What's your name, ma'am? Becky. Becky. You're my favorite central member. <laughs> You're the secretary? So you are serving. Yeah. Listen, folks, I want to give you three quick alliterations. Prayerfully, hopefully, it will be useful to you as you matriculate down the King's Highway as we climb Jacob's Ladder together. I'm sure you wouldn't be here on a rainy, stormy Wednesday night. Listen, see? You wouldn't be here if you weren't trying to go to heaven, right? Yeah, you wouldn't be. The Wednesday night crowd is the people. Those usually are your service people. That's, yeah, my Sunday morning folk, listen, I don't even hardly know some of their names. But Wednesday night... Those are my core people. It's stormy. It's rainy. You rather be, you've been working all week. It's hump day. It's Wednesday. You'll be sitting at home getting ready to watch the debate on TV. But the real people usually come on Wednesday night, right? That's, okay. So y'all trying to go to heaven, right? Yeah. Amen belongs there, right? Now, I'm not, you want to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go? Amen. Now, I'm not talking about going tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, some of you look at me funny. I, I'm not talking about loading up tonight. I'm just saying, <laughs> e e e eventually, uh, uh, what we want to do is give you tools in your toolbox to help this journey to heaven be more effective and efficient. That's what we do. We take the Bible, this book called the Bible, and now we're going to dissect and pontificate and elucidate on this text Hopefully that you leave with an efficacious spirit. I learned something that will help me be a better Christian, better husband, better wife, better member of the Lord's body. Now, since he uses this term house, that's for me and my house. He speaks uh, with authority given to him by God about his house. Uh, because, see, the house of the home is the center of what the church does. We become family, even in the church, right? Uh, aren't we family? Yeah. Yeah. Slate Moore and our brothers. We, we, the only reason I know him, the only reason he knows me, we're from different parts of the world. We went to different schools. We have different interests. I probably got him about 20 years or so. Slate, you look pretty young, fit, fine. Uh, listen, uh, the only reason we have any association is the blood of Jesus. Amen. So we become family because of the church. God makes us family. And no matter if you don't like me, you don't ever want me back to Central, I'm still in your family. So I'm going to give you three quick things we need in the house. We need to access family, we need to access finances, and we need to work on our faith. Is that all right? Amen. See, here's the thing about family, okay? House, family. 
You can pick your friends. You can pick your nose. But you can't pick your family. Amen, Belongs. <laughs> All of us have people in our biological family that we probably wish wasn't in there. <laughs> Am I the only person, man? <laughs> I mean, you got a cousin or uncle or somebody that if you see them in Walmart and they don't see you, you try to go the other way, you know, like... <laughs> I got an Uncle Bubba like that. Okay, Uncle Bubba is one of those guys, if I see him somewhere, if I'm back home in Tallahassee, if I see Uncle Bubba, he doesn't see me, I get incognito. <laughs> I become stealth. You, you know, you, you, you guess if I see him and he's, hey, nephew, he's loud, bodacious. He always, and by the, hey, you got $10? You know, he's one of those kind of guys. <laughs> Comes to the family reunion, he don't pay his registration. He eats up all the food. And then he wants to argue the Bible. You, you, you don't have anybody in the family. Okay. There's all, all of us have family members that we probably, if we could pick, they wouldn't be in there. You can't pick family. Family comes without your consent. That's biologically and spiritually. You don't pick who's in the kingdom of God. God adds to the church who he wants that. So you can't come here and decide, I don't want to be with him. I don't like her. I don't do him. Listen, folks, we are family. And while I'm flying over that territory, seemingly since you all are uh, maybe not in total agreement with me, I might as well go ahead and say what I want to say, right? Uh, listen, th this whole thing about being married. Anybody here tonight married? Anybody married? You, you know, y'all you, you know that marriage and the home are the centrality of what God, that's the first institution, right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, when, when, when Paul taught about the church in Ephesians 5, he used marriage and the home as the blueprint to teach about the church in Jesus Christ. Read it when you're in the personal privacy of your praying ground. Beloved, listen, I have to tell the people back home, listen, marriage is not for the happy, it's for the holy. Amen. Amen. Amen belongs there, right? How long have you been married, Slate? 23 years. Okay. I've been married 38 years, Slate. If you want to be happy, you might not just want to get married, okay? It's not, it's not for happy people, it's for holy people. Okay, y'all still ain't got it, right? Look how you wrote. Okay, watch this. In 35 years of preaching in the Lord's Church, I've married scores probably 500 couples. I never join people in happy matrimony. What I join them is holy matrimony. Amen. Amen belongs there. See, we have duped people into believing that you get married to be happy. No, you get married to be holy. And if you marry the right person, some happiness will break out. <laughs> Yeah. Amen. I, I figured if I keep tugging on that line, somebody go. If we could, in a moment of personal transparency, transparency, and a moment of personal integrity, let's be honest. Can we be honest for a moment? There's nobody in here that's been married over three days who has not had buyer's remorse. <laughs> nobody. There's been a day or two you woke up and you said, my God. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> Listen, folks, you're not always going to be happy in marriage, but you always got to be holy in marriage. Amen belongs to that. Amen. We, we, we don't teach people right, okay? I, I'm happily married most of the time. Yeah. Amen belongs to that. <laughs> okay, we, we different. Some, my wife wants to watch Lifetime and HGTV. <laughs> and somehow or another she thinks that she has a right to dominate the big TV. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> but, but I'm always loving the holy matrimony we're in. Marriage is not for happy, it's for holy people. I'm trying to teach. Am I doing all right? You know, I'm kind of insecure sometimes. Am I doing all right? Uh, and, and while I'm flying over that, see, marriage is a good marriage. We're talking about the house tonight. That's for me and my house. See, a good marriage is like a wedding band, right? 
Uh, a good wedding band is just how your marriage should work. If you put on your band and it's too tight, it'll cut off your circulation. If you put on your wedding band and it's too loose, it'll fall off easily. But if you put it on and it fits just right, you can see it, you can wear it. It's not too tight or too loose. This is how marriage works. If, 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 you're, if you're too tight, you, your, your spouse can't breathe without you. Sister Slate Moore can't go to the ladies' day or shopping in Orlando or Lakeland with the sisters without Slate calling 24 times. <laughs> I hope I'm not. <laughs> uh, okay, I already do, okay. Uh, or if your husband can't be five minutes late without you going through his phone or his Facebook or his Instagram or his Snapchat or his Twitter account. If, 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 if you have no breathing room. See, in marriage, you get to have privacy, but you don't get to have secrets. Amen belongs there. Amen. See, see, good marriages fit like a ring. It just fits just right. Not too tight. Not too loose. And so when we want the church to grow, we got to work on our homes. Got to work on our houses. Everybody got me? And one thing I know, brothers, help me out. Y'all been scared all night. In Genesis chapter 3, when God made Eve, he said, Adam, I'm going to make for you a suitable helper. And the King James Virgin say, our helpmate. And God made you sisters to be our helpmate, not our cellmate. <laughs> Amen belongs there. <laughs> My Christian top brother about to come along here now. Uh, 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 you, you're not a cellmate, you're a helpmate. Okay? Okay. What, what we want. Brothers, I'm trying to help you. You're not helping me help you. <laughs> I tell my wife this way. Okay, let me give it a I don't mind fighting Mike Tyson in a heavyweight fight as long as I know if I fight him for three minutes in the middle of the ring, he can hit me, I can hit him, he can bloody me up, bust my lip, make my eyes swell. And all I want to know though is when the, the round is over and I go to my corner, I sit on my stool, I don't have to worry about the people in my corner swinging at me. Y'all still don't know when to say amen, right? What have to, see, we can fight all day. We can fight uh, the system. We can fight the government. We can fight evil. We can fight, uh, we can fight uh, the demonic forces. We can deal with bill collectors. We can deal with sexism, racism. But when you go home, you ought not have to fight people that you're married to. They ought to be in your corner. Amen. <laughs> and when you got to fight more at home than you're doing out there, there's a problem somewhere. As for me and my house, we want peace at home. <laughs> amen. amen. Sister Becky, say amen there. You, you, you wrote the sign, so you ought to be. <laughs> we got we to gotta make sure our homes are right. And, and one of the things that plagues us is because we have bad information. This is for holy people. Okay? Happiness is a byproduct, but you get married because you're holy. Not because you're happy. Okay, I wish I had time to deal with that. It's a whole lot more. And secondarily, so I'd be obedient to the time, not only in our, we need to concentrate on our family, in every family, you need to concentrate on your finances. Do you not know the data suggests, the studies reveal, empirical data suggests, that most people that divorce, and we're almost at 67% in America, Unfortunately, sometimes in the church is almost as high in the world in divorce. Listen, folks, most people divorce because of money problems, not infidelity. Yeah, I thought oh, well, surely it would be infidelity. No, nah. the number one reason people get divorced is because of financial reasons. If we understand that when we're in the house, the home, we're holy, and then we learn how to manage our money. We, we learn that, and I'm not a financial advisor, but I have studied the Bible. And do you know God's financial plan is better than Wall Street? It's better than that, the annuities and the uh, other uh, 
uh, stocks and bonds you possess better than the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Listen, folks, if you do what your money, what God instructs you, you'll never go without. Now, I'm a witness. Listen. Now, sometimes I'm preaching from theorem. Sometimes I'm preaching from experience. Uh, for years, I didn't give right. I just thought I didn't have enough. If some people tell me I can't afford to give, but you can't afford not to give, right? And when my wife and I became spiritual, godly, biblical givers, we have never lacked. We probably never going to be rich. We're certainly not rich. I'm not rich. I preach for the Church of Christ. <laughs> I do preach for the Church of Christ. I'm not rich. But we don't lack anything we need. And so, you know when you're blessed? It's when you got everything you need. And on top of that, God's so good. Not only do we have everything we need, we got most of what we want. Isn't that a good God? Amen. Okay, let me help you. Since time is running out, brevity of time is uh, forcing me to move with phonetic speed. I got an ocean full of information and a teaspoon worth of time. Okay? Uh, Jack. Let me give you an illustration. This is how you can bless your finances, right? There was an old farmer in rural Georgia who didn't go past the sixth grade. But he's very wealthy. He's a millionaire. And uh, he walked around the city with old overhauls on, brogan shoes, drove an old raggedy truck. No evidence of having money, but he had a lot of money. And his contemporaries in the city Harvard and Yale and prestigious and prodigious universities with academic regalia hanging on the wall, uh, they, they all had a lot of money in the bank. And so uh, the Harvard Ivy League guys noticed that when the old man came into the bank, that the bank president would leave his office, come out and greet him. So they asked him, why do you come out and greet this, this old man and uh, you don't come out and greet us? And uh, Becky, they're calling you. Uh, <laughs> that's what happens when you work for the church. I, uh, I, I know how it works. I got one. Uh, seriously, they explain to the president, you don't come and greet us, and we got millions here. But you come out and greet this old man, and the president explained, that, that old man has more money in this bank than all of y'all. And they decided to ask him, and said, well, how did you acquire your wealth? You're not educated. You didn't matriculate from an institute of higher learning like we did. You drive around in an old truck. You got on overhauls with Borgain shoes. You, you, you're a farmer. Where did you get all this money? And the old man hastened to tell him something you ought to remember tonight. He says, well, if you really want to know my secret to financial sovereignty and success, he says, I, I shovel into God's bin. And he said, and God shovels then into my bin. And they said, that's it? He said, yeah, that's it. He said, well, explain. what do you mean? He said, I'll explain to you again. Jack, he said, I shovel into God's bin. God subsequently shovels into my bin. He said, well, how did that make you rich? He said, because God's shovel is bigger than my shovel. <laughs> Amen, belongs to that. Amen. If you ever become generous with God, and God becomes generous with you, God is a lot more generous than you can ever be. He's, look, he's great. He's generous with grace and mercy, and he will be generous with your finances. See, see, there's nothing worse in a church. You know, y'all got them because we got them too. There are people that are struggling with their finances. They, 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 they might have a husband, wife, several children, but they never figured out the money thing. And when you have money problems, it kind of creeps into every other area of your life. Y'all know that, right? So you need to work, church needs to work on our families. Church needs to work to help people learn how to manage their finances. And since that didn't go over well, let me show you this. The last thing I'll tell you is that it's a trifecta. It's a trilogy. Family, finances, and your faith. In your home, in your family, as for me and my house, not only are we going to serve the Lord, we're going to have a strong faith. Faith by definition 
Hebrews 11 and 1, if you recall. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you can't see. If you can see it, it's not faith. Y'all do know that, right? Okay, you still didn't get it. If you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. Okay, y'all didn't get that. If you don't see where you're going before you get where you're going, when you get where you're going, you won't know where you are. Okay, y'all still didn't get it. If what you see is all you see, then you're not seeing what God wants you to see. Okay, y'all still didn't get it. Faith is not jumping to conclusions. Faith is coming to the conclusion to jump. Y'all still ain't get it. Okay, let me linearize it for you. I had to do this for my church, right? Because when I say theological, right? you ever do this? Like, sometimes you can be very theological and people don't get it. Let me linearize it. I had to do this for my church. So let me explain to you what faith is. Let me, let me give you the Wesley T. Leonard uh, version, explanation of faith. Because it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you can't see. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and he's rewarded them that diligently seek him. Here's the Leonard version of what faith is. Faith is believing something is so, even when it does not appear to be so, in order that it might become so, simply because God said so. Amen. Can I get a little better, amen? Amen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one more time. You might... I want to put this in your catalog. <clears throat> put it in your database, your spiritual database. Faith is believing something is so, even when it does not appear to be so, in order that it might become so, simply because God said so. Amen. That's what faith is. So what we're doing now, systematically, chronically, repetitively, is we work on our families, we strengthen our finances and we develop and maintain our faith. Amen. That is the kind of house Joshua was trying to develop. It's the kind of house you and I need. It's almost time for us to go, but we really can't leave right now because, you know, you know, uh, uh, I'm more intrigued than ever to try to be a man of faith, a man of God. I want to be a good husband, a good father, a good minister in the Bible, in the, in the church. I, I want us to be sovereign, my family and I, and our finances. I want the church finances to be sovereign. But most importantly, I want to develop and maintain this covenant relationship that I have with God only through Jesus Christ. And not only will heaven be our home, but we got to learn to start enjoying the journey. Sometimes we're so focused on the destination, we forget to enjoy the journey. God is so good, not only he has a heavenly home prepared for us, but he has a road to heaven that can be most enjoyable for his children. Lord, deliver me from miserable Christians. Mean Christians. Toxic. I know y'all don't have any here. I know. But in Orlando, we got some members who sometimes look like they just left a parole board hearing <laughs> that didn't come out in their favor. That's how they look. And I just think being in Christ, we ought to have a high measure of joy Amen. and love and affection one for another. I just believe that. I'm so glad to be here tonight with you guys. I leave you with this. And it's about faith. Joshua said, you ready with me. Uh, which God you're going to serve? God that your father served on the other side of the flood? The God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? But as for me and my house, Joshua said, I'm speaking parenthetically for the whole house. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Faith is the cornerstone for the Christian belief. None of us saw what Jesus did on that cross. But by faith, I believe it. P. 
Penny and Mary, I'm done. Jack, I'm done. And I want to invite you to Christ. Penny and Mary, I'm sorry, not Penny and Mary. Mary and Jane were playing outside. This is a faith story. Mary and Jane were playing outside, and they decided they would count their money. So Mary pulled out of her pocket all the money she had. She put it on the ground and counted. She had five pennies. She said, one, two, three, four, five. She had five pennies. And then Jane pulled out her money. Jane put her money on the ground. She too said, one, two, three, four, five. But Jane says, I got 10 pennies. Mary said, that's some strange math. Count your pennies again. I got five. Mary counted hers, one, two, three, four, five. She said, count your pennies again, Jane. Jane said, one, two, three, four, five. So I got 10 pennies. So Mary said, that's some strange math. She said, that's the kind of math they use in Washington, D.C. She said, what kind of math is that? She said, Mary, count, Jane, count your pennies one more time. She said, one, two, three, four, five. I got 10 pennies. How can you have 10 pennies when we're both looking at five? She said, oh, I'm counting the five I have, and I'm also counting the five my father said he'll give me when he got home. Y'all don't know when to say amen, okay? As Christians, we got to learn to count what we have, and then we got to count what God's going to do that we have yet to see. God bless you. God keep you. This is our prayer. Let me invite you to Jesus tonight. Let me invite you to be added to his body, which is the church. Let me invite you to be a part of the family of God, the household of God. And you automatically tonight, if you're an alien sinner, a barbarian, uh, uh, strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, if, if you come tonight, you leave if you're baptized with a whole new family. Amen. And I don't know much about the people here, but I do know they're members of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the kingdom of God. Now you're going to leave here with a whole lot more family and friends than you came tonight. How do I do that, Brother Preacher? Well, you know, you hear. God allows us to use our senses. What do you hear? The gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. That's what it means, good news. What is the good news? That Christ died for our sins. It's a vicarious, ignominious death. He, it's a substitution of death. He died in our place. Then you got to believe that because, because you hear something doesn't mean you believe it. If I told you tonight that I have a million dollars in my trunk of my car and the first person to get to my car gets the million dollars, you know how I know you don't believe that? Because you're still sitting here. <laughs> when somebody hears something and it's good news and they believe it, they act on it. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> <laughs> Let me save you some trouble. Uh, uh, you, you, you hear about what Jesus did. Do you believe it? Then you repent. It means to turn away from your ways of sin, degradation, and iniquity. Jesus said in Luke 13 and 3, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Then you confess. You become verbal, audible. You acknowledge before God in this company, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the inerrant, only begotten of God the Father. Then you join him. Must not need, not ought be imperative language. Is used. You must be baptized, submerged, immersed in water for the remission, removal, and the eradication of your sin. That process adds you to the church. You, you can't join the church. This is not a country club. You can't join. You're at it. And then you become a part of the household of God. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you're here tonight and you need or want to be baptized, come. If you're here tonight, you're already a member, but you veered to the right or the left. You've sinned and need to repent. You can come. If you're here tonight, you desire prayer for yourself or bequeath prayer for another, I beg, beseech, admonish, exhort you to come while we stand and whatever's appropriate. If there's a song of invitation or there's...